Hello and thanks for joining me today while we go over a little bit about digital twins and how they lower the risk for both product development and product operations. So I wanted to start with the story. Uh, this was from a customer that we worked with who were developing a pick and place robot. And this robot was an operation and they were noticing that there were some repeated failures with certain motors. They were overheating and they were burning out. So we worked with them to help create a model or a digital twin of the product they had. And we were able to do some dynamic analysis to figure out all the different torques and moments at various places on this, uh, on this robot. Uh, and these were sort of tools that the company didn't have before. Um, one of the main things we were able to provide them was a dynamic analysis um, so a lot more than just what the steady state torques are going to be, but really at every moment, um, a full physics-based answer for the different amounts of torques that are going to be experienced by motors. So what we were able to find was that at certain brief moments uh, along the motion path, there were these really large torque spikes. And with their previous analysis, they couldn't find this. So the company was looking at replacing motors over and over again because of these burnouts. But after we did some analysis with the model that we built them, we were able to just show them that we could modify the motion path and we could maintain the cycles per minute that they needed, uh, but we, we could modify it in such a way that the torque burnouts weren't going to happen anymore just by slowing it down at, at certain parts. So that was sort of a story about how having really high performance design tools and having proper model based ways of inspecting your products, um, how they can really lend themselves to better designs. And with all of the movement towards different trends with industry 4.0 tools, uh, what we're seeing is that machines are needing to be, you know, they're needing to perform faster, they're needing to increase their cycles per minute. Uh, there's a whole range of optimizations that are driving more and more performance out of these machines. And in some areas, our tools just aren't really keeping pace with the demands that are placed upon machine designers uh, and even machine buyers. So there are certain kinds of technologies that we, we just need to adopt sooner rather than later to keep pace with this. And what we're going to talk about today, what I want to talk about, is what we call the digital twin. Uh, which is really just a way of saying a virtual representation of a corresponding physical product. Uh, this being a physics-based representation of all the different dynamics and movements that are happening within a device that you're designing. Given that it's such a, a physics-based representation that really understands how this thing is going to move, what the forces are going to be involved, what the temperatures, um, these things can be great on the designer side for conceptual development. So you're able to sort of spot system-wide performance issues before you need to build a prototype and have this thing fail spectacularly once it's built. Uh, you can kind of tease these things out as you're designing it. They're also great for virtual commissioning and for the designers in the crowd. You might be familiar with the commissioning process and how much of a pain that can be uh, to try and bring everything together and hope that your PLC is going to work properly with your machine. Um, so to go in a virtual commissioning path, you're going to do some of that PLC testing up front uh, against a digital twin, against a virtual model, and you can spot a whole bunch of errors before you need to take this thing to the physical machine. It's going to help a lot too with online diagnostics, which is where you have a, a virtual representation. So you've got the digital twin uh, in parallel with the actual physical machine that's running. And you can spot performance deviations really well. And that can help you with a ton of diagnostics. Maybe this is because certain motors are stopping to work or there are frictions somewhere. Um, it's sort of like the ultimate diagnostic guidebook to help you understand where you might need to make some tweaks. And all of this is going to help ensure in addition to lots of things, a longer lifespan for your product. Um, so as the years go by and your physical machine is starting to maybe perform differently, with a digital twin running alongside it, you can have a much greater range of options in how you want to go forward. You know, perhaps you want to start to put a little bit more load on a certain motor. Or perhaps you know that, well, you only have to reduce your cycles per minute by a small amount, and that would get you uh, just great performance with the older machine you have. Um, these are the kind of things you can do with a digital twin that can be really hard to do otherwise. And there are also two kinds of digital twins, and I'll just briefly outline them. 
Uh, the first being what you might consider more of a traditional digital twin. Uh, it was the, the form that uh, when digital twins were first coming on the scene, this is really what they meant. Um, digital twins based mostly off data. And that's a digital twin that you have to make after your physical device is already uh, produced. And then what you do is you're taking all the different sensor data off that device and you're doing a whole host of processing to create a, a sort of statistical model of how this thing performs. And then once you've got that, then you can start to make predictions about how things might look. But it's really a collection of performance data, um, not necessarily a sort of underlying physics space understanding of how it works. So all of this can still provide great benefits and it's often done in some cloud-based platform because there's a lot of computing power required for this. What I want to focus on a bit more are what we call model-driven digital twins. So this is the, the sense of, of taking a, a system-level modeling software tool and creating a digital twin that actually is rooted in the underlying physics of how things work. So how do two joints come together and what are the different frictions that would be involved um, depending on a host of parameters. So at the base of a model-driven digital twin is a bunch of accurate high fidelity physics. Um, sure, it can be tough to put together, but what you get out of that uh, is really a lot. The ability for to make predictions ends up having a lot more fidelity because the thing itself is modeled in a way that is really useful for those kinds of predictions. And it's also going to help with certain things that um, maybe could be tougher with a data-driven digital twin. Uh, like I said in that previous slide, doing some reconfiguration with a machine you already have is, um, is a really great way to use a digital twin uh, for something that is going to help prolong the lifespan of a machine that you have. So we'll focus on this second one. So there's a few different ways this can be done. Uh, if you're a designer, you probably want to start with your CAD files, and then you can import them into a system-level modeling tool. Uh, the one that you're seeing here is our software called MapleSim. And from that point, uh, everything gets broken out into a physics-based block diagram where you're going to implement joints and motors and motion paths. And all of this is going to be driven by the actual um, physics at play. So this is where you start to layer in your CAD information with more of the multi-domain features about how the motors are, are set up and things like that. Um, so once you've got all that together, and of course there's lots of details there, but just at a high level, once you've got that together, uh, you've now got essentially what we call a digital twin. And if you're looking to do some sort of virtual commissioning like we talked about, like if you're looking to actually set this up uh, in step with your PLC code, uh, you can take this model and you can export it using what's called the functional mockup interface standard. So you can kind of send this over to a lot of common automation software. And then you can start to test your control programs against this virtual model. So there's a whole step of testing you can do now. You can do it quickly. There's not going to be huge costs if there are failures. And you can start to do a bit of this virtual commissioning in your common automation software. And then if you want to take it a step further, you can start to test your PLC code, uh, your physical PLC code against that digital twin too, uh, all before being ready to actually commission your machine and have it there. Uh, you can then have your digital twin running alongside that uh, for all those diagnostics and operation features that we talked about before. Uh, another way you can do this though is, let's say you've already got a machine built, but you still want a digital twin. Um, what you can do is you can start with your machine, you can gather a variety of sensor data that you may already have, and you can start to undergo the same process to create a digital twin to then pair up with the machine that you already have, uh, unlocking all those benefits that we talked about earlier. So for designers, for those of you who are designers, the main things you're going to really love out of this is that you can really explore new kinds of designs way faster than you previously could. Uh, you can run optimizations, you can explore those sort of what-if scenarios, and you can see the trade-offs um, in a matter of seconds rather than days, weeks, or months. So it really gives you a lot more freedom to really test your concept level designs in a much quicker way. And of course, for so many folks, has commissioning can be a huge pain. Um, 
I think there was one study that said that doing a virtual commissioning process uh, can help reduce the amount of commit or the amount of errors in the commissioning process by up to 75%. So you really get to overall smooth out your commissioning process and reduce errors when you take on a technique like this. And just as a specific example, uh, for many folks, if you're going to be undertaking a new design um, or you're really trying to squeeze the most performance you can out of a design, uh, you want to make sure that motor is really sized properly. Uh, you don't want to undersize it and have it burn out over time, but you also don't want to waste money and oversize it uh, and then have to carry those costs on to a customer. And now if you are a buyer and you're looking to buy a machine, you're probably not as interested in designing a digital twin yourself. Uh, but these things have a lot of value for you to actually use. So if you're looking to understand how to minimize downtime on your line, uh, every machine is going to maybe deteriorate a bit differently or its environmental conditions are different. So if you can have digital twins for different machines, you can actually get a better sense of how to predict the lifespan of that machine and what you might need to maintain. So it's a real great tool for minimizing downtime. If you need to look into replacing a part or something like that, digital twins can help you do some reconfiguration. So maybe slow things down um, or maybe just offset some load to another arm. There's some things you're going to be able to do here to prevent having to spend a lot of money to replace these machines. Um, so it can end up saving quite a bit of money. And then overall, let's say you've got uh, an order to fulfill where you need to have you know, the order delivered in a low period of time. Um, a digital twin will sort of give you the, the evidence or the data you would need to say, well, what if I need to up my cycles per minute by some large amount? Uh, how much lifespan am I taking off my machine by pushing my machines that hard for a couple weeks? Uh, without a digital twin, those can just be really hard questions to answer where if you had a digital twin running, you might be able to actually do some math on uh, maybe losing a few months of estimated lifespan. It might end up being worth it for an important customer. So uh, you're going to have those abilities where at this point, uh, these are things that not many people have because they're not using these kind of uh, high performance tools. So I'll just wrap this up with two examples that will really touch on what we talked about. And one has to do with uh, prolonging the lifespan of a machine. This is just a customer that came to us some time ago and they had a handful of machines uh, and they were overshooting their motion path. So the machine was just no longer working properly and uh, it was aging and they just wanted to figure out if there's a way they could fix that. So we helped them go in and create a digital twin for that machine. And now that there was a digital twin, we could actually feed in some of the sensor data off their aging machine. And then by using that now, we've got a digital twin of that machine as it is as an older machine. And then we can start to recalibrate the motion controllers because what we need to do is just get it to end up in the right spot. So we were able to help recreate the control code based on the digital twins um, model of the actual machine as it is. So this is something that you know, there's not really motor specifications for a, a very specific machine that's aged based on certain conditions. So we are able to help them get that machine up and running again. In terms of reducing downtime, we were um, working with a customer too that they wanted to really minimize the downtime on uh, wind turbine farms. And what we were able to do is help them create a model of how the, the bearings are going to look in wind turbines. And uh, there's a lot of forces at play there. And what we were able to help them out with was creating a, a real accurate sense of uh, a maintenance schedule that's going to be continuously refined. But that helped them reduce some, some amounts of downtime there. Because again, each, each windmill is going to be different. And having a maintenance schedule that's based off this kind of accurate physics-based information uh, ends up be making a huge difference when it comes to managing massive wind farms. So lastly, I'm just going to talk about why these things aren't everywhere at this moment. I tried to make them sound good, and I really think that there's a, there's a lot of potential here. We're seeing an adoption of these increase. Um, but at the same time, it's, it's not always easy to take on something new like this. Um, so digital twins aren't exactly simple to create. Um, but I guess one of the great things about them is 
if you're interested in creating a digital twin for a certain machine or two, uh, they're not really something that you need to create. This is where a lot of companies out there are able to perform that as sort of a contracted service. And then you just got that tool. Uh, it's like in your company, you're not really creating all the specific tooling that you're using. You're, you're paying for it to be made for you, and then you're realizing all the value from that. And of course, uh, change is not always easy, especially when it's such a new technology that can offer so many different ways of doing things. So there's a resistance there to, uh, to change. But like any tool, there's a wide range of things you can do with a digital twin. So it's about picking off a couple things that are the closest to what your company's looking for. And just starting with that, um, and then over time really developing the, the whole range of how you could get value out of something like this. And lastly, this can just be something that is fairly unclear from an ROI perspective. Um, but for the customers we've worked with, it's been the same story over and over that once they've actually experienced some value from this, it's quite obvious to them um, the kinds of capabilities that a digital twin can offer. So that's it for me on, uh, on digital twins and virtual commissioning and how these things can really help uh, your designs and your machines from a performance and reliability standpoint. Uh, I'd like to thank you for joining us. And if you have any questions, please contact me at gjackson at mablesoft.com.